Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonality. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. My name is Bertine Crevacore West, and I am your host. I'm delighted to have with us a special guest today, Ms. Monique Russell. She is an executive coach, leadership guru, communications expert at Clear Communication Solutions. Monique, welcome to our show. Hey, hey, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you. I've been looking forward to having you on the show for some time. I'm going to tell our listeners a little bit about you, and then you can fill us in on the stuff that um, we don't know. (laughs) So um, you earned a Bachelor of Science in Broadcast Journalism, as well as two master's degrees, a Master's of Science, one in Public Relations, and the other one in Advertising. You're a trained DISC facilitator and certified life coach. I love how you describe your ethnicity. You're, now tell me if I'm pronouncing this correctly, Bagarican? <laughs> it? It's Bajerican. Okay. Bajerican. Oh my goodness. Okay. Thank you for that. I'm glad I asked. Bajerican. That sounds better. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, yes. So Bajerican is a mixture of Bahama- Bahamanian, Nigerian, and American. Am I okay? Yes, I'm pronouncing everything correctly. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you served as a public speaking subject matter expert at the collegiate level. You're an avid reader and you love to travel. You're also a licensed realtor and you designed a public speaking curriculum for Southern New Hampshire University. You're a pescatarian who loves sushi. You have much in common with one of my sisters. (laughs) Um, And you enjoy connecting virtually all over the globe with people. You've taught over 2,000 adults and you also serve as a communications expert for government agencies such as the Center for Disease Control and Fortune 100 companies. Monique, that's an extensive resume and and a fabulous one, if I do say so myself. Welcome to our show. Thank you. So tell us, thank you. I'm sure I missed a little bit. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. Anything you want to add? Um, Oh my gosh, like what what can I add? What can I say? Um, I am a mom. I'm a mom. I'm a business owner. My company is Clear Communication Solutions. And I am passionate about helping people to improve their relationships, to have positive and productive relationships. Too many of us have come from cultures and societies and conditioning that have clouded the way we show up in the world. And I feel that it is important and essential for everyone to, to step into an awareness, to get more clear about who they are so that their relationships can move forward productively and positively. Oh, I love that. I love that. And that's part of Global Fluency's mission overall, is to really help people have more authentic communications. And as we focus on diversity, inclusion, and cultural competence, one of the key factors of diversity, I think, is differing communication styles. And I I love that your work talks about culture and how that impacts us, right? And and sometimes how it it can propel us and and it can also impede us. And so I want to dive in deeply with you when we're talking about emotional intelligence. That's one of your offerings that you, you give at um, Clear Communications. Um, and I want, to, I want to talk to you a bit more about that. But first, tell me what led you to working in this field? Well, I think the field chose me. 
So I have been in communications all my life. When I left the islands, the beautiful islands of the Bahamas, I studied, as you shared earlier, broadcast journalism. So I have I have three degrees in communications, and what I wanted to do was be on TV, investigative reporter, covering things all over the world. And I guess that what I am doing today is a bit of that, because I help people to discover and uncover who they are, learn more about their personality styles, and things like that. Um, emotional intelligence, I'd say, is like a framework. It's just a beautiful framework for us that embodies both aspects of communications. And I, I always put two, two main categories of the communication. Interpersonal, which is intrapersonal inside of ourselves and interpersonal, which is outside when we deal with others. And basically the emotional intelligence framework has, I would say four main components, your self-awareness, your self-management, your relationship skills, and your social skills. So a lot of people tend to focus on those things that are your external, the relationship skills, the social skills. How do I present as a confident public speaker? How do I have executive presence? How do I get my team to do what I need them to do? How do I get people to play along? You know, they, they want to focus on how do I read the room? How do I show up and look like a boss? All those external things. <laughs> Um, are what most people tend to focus on, but what is most important is the internal stuff. That's that intrapersonal, which is your self-awareness and your self-management. And people have it the reverse. Um, your self-awareness really is like, you know, do you know your strengths? Do you know your weaknesses? A lot of people think they know what they're good at, but they can't tell you what they're not good at. No, you know, do you know what you're motivated by? Do you know your energy cycle? It's the time of day that you're most productive. These are things that fall into our awareness. How do I make myself more engaged when I'm feeling bored? Bored is a feeling. It's not a state, it's a feeling. So how do I, how do I, how do I change my emotion from um, a negative state to a positive state. So all these things are like our triggers, even our general optimism, how we look at things, how we perceive things. And that self-management, once you have the self-awareness, now you know your triggers, now you can go from, instead of going from zero to 100, when you have something that comes up, you're gonna go from zero to 50, or maybe zero to 20, or maybe zero to 10. And then you get better at it and you practice. So that when something happens, instead of it taking a week that you are thinking about it and you're like, okay, I'm stuck. I'm not, I don't know what to do. I said I was going to do this and I, I haven't done it. And it's three months now, instead of something holding you or weighing you down for a week or a day, maybe you get to that point where you've practiced so much that in the moment that thought comes up in your head that might say, you know, oh, I'm not the person for the job. I'm like, Shh, I got you. Yeah, I am the person for the job. I know where that's coming from. In this moment, I'm feeling afraid because I've never done this before. You know, I need to step out of my comfort zone. So those, those are, I guess, the pieces of emotional intelligence that have chosen me because I've done this work in communications pretty much all my life. That took me on a journey. And I thank you for that because I feel like you were in my head um, for many things, but even some, for something as recently as yesterday. Because what, what I unpack from that is that first we have to acknowledge and truly acknowledge what we are good at, which, you know, some of us, most of us, as you said, can do easily. No problem. I'm great at this. I'm great at that. But what were our weaknesses, I think, are what truly define us, right? Because if we don't acknowledge those, we can't uncover those strengths that we might have hidden that we may not even ourselves know about, right? We can't discover our own resilience if we don't acknowledge those weaknesses. So I went through um, something silly yesterday, um, and I know that it would have annoyed me in the past um, for a much longer period of time. But in the moment, I was able to decode what I was feeling, why I was feeling it, and, and really understand that what I was feeling was a reflection um, of something internal rather than the, the, the person or the situation causing me that. And that did not happen overnight. Like now it can, but it was like, when I'm hearing you talk about this, it's like riding a bike 
right? Um, I don't know about you, but my experience riding a bike was horrendous. I remember learning, I didn't learn until I was 12. And so, wow. yes, I was an old bike rider. So <laughs> the reason for that was because um, I, I, had never, I had never been on a bike before. And so I got one as a present and I said, I was going to learn and I was trying to teach myself and I kept hitting a particular fence. And then one day after many scratches on just one side of my body, I was able to get through that fence. And, and it was because I knew um, that I had to not give up. I had to keep trying, right? Even though I was getting beat up by a fence that was an inanimate object. <laughs> so I, I share that with you because I feel like this is, this is what we do as, as individuals when we're trying to figure out where we are emotionally, right? And I love that you said that, um, you know, even with boredom, that it is a feeling and not a state, right? So the boredom is actually not something that defines me, but it's something I'm going through and I can mm -hmm. change that and change it. So I really, I love knowing that. Yeah. Just stepping into that awareness is creating an empowered state. Because if you say, I am bored, I am. I am not bored. I feel bored. So when you categorize it as a feeling, that means, oh, well, what can I do to change this feeling? What can I do to move to an empowered state? So just, just having that awareness can give you the momentum that you need to take action to do something different. And moving in that empowered state, that is literally um, a psychological and emotional shift, right? It's, it's a way for us to not get caught up in that emotional quicksand and fall into this negative thinking cycle, which I see um, in my experience with, with other women, especially um, business women um, who, who are successful, they, they also admit to having this, this negative loop, thought loop in their heads. And that is something that has to be conquered um, daily until they can get to this place where they're like, oh, wait, no, I'm good. You know, and in a state of something like we're not stuck there and that we can shift those feelings. Mm -hmm. is empowering. So I'm going to ask you then, well, I think we almost got into the next question, really. Why is this such an important skill? Well, and, and I, and I want to address what you said, too, in, in terms of women who are accomplished feeling negative. I just want to say everybody feels that. Everybody feels that we're human. And I think that if we move into this um, notion that it's going to be conquered forever, we're setting ourselves up to fail. Um, no matter how accomplished or how successful you are, people go through emotional states, just like we get up and we have to eat every day. We can't take one day and say, okay, I'm going to eat for 24 hours and I'm good for the rest of the week. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> It doesn't it did, work like that. I think that would change the dieting industry completely. <laughs> Look, like it doesn't, you cannot front load the work of, of remaining in a positive state. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to ever have a, a situation where you've arrived, where there's going to be something where you are never, ever, I finally arrived. Nothing can make me upset. Well, if nothing can make you upset, that's kind of stale because yeah. we do go into cycles. Because then we you're just stuck on one level for always. It. Yeah, yeah, and I, I don't think that's realistic. Yeah, it's not. So I just always like to say, you know, just kind of, to kind of let everything come out in the open that it is okay. These things happen. You're normal. Nothing's wrong with you. But when you do have those moments, you need to be able to recognize it and then have the tools to move from a negative state to a positive state. But don't beat up yourself. Don't feel guilty that, you know, oh, why can't I just be positive all the time? Because then that's not healthy either. I, oh, I, I really find to agree with you. I think that um, people, um, women in particular, want to be seen, especially, you know, when they are um, working in the corporate arena, they want to be seen as superwomen and, and nothing is going to phase me. And, and I think quite honestly, a superwoman is the one that can take a personal pause and acknowledge what they're going through in the moment, um, because that will build resilience as opposed to um, putting on the shield um, that, that really is like a, like a, glass shield rather than you know a fortified one and and you know like one made in wakanda um if, if, I'm, going to, if I'm 
going to reference some, um, yeah, I'm a huge comic book fan, so if I'm going to reference something like that, you know, I want something made out of the Wakanda. Okay, everyone will get that reference, something made out of vibranium rather than glass. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I really think that that is really what gives us long-term um, resilience, right? And so I always say that that situations happen and they don't define me, but but and I can't control them, but I can control my reaction to them, right? So um, instead of flying off on a handle about something or or becoming really upset more than is necessary, um, because that behavior, I think we have to acknowledge it, but then we can't be stuck by it, right? So it goes back to what you were saying about a state versus a feeling. Mm -hmm. I think that yeah. that helps propel us forward. And, and that is, I think, what turns us into the, the, the authentic superwomen um, that we innately are. And mm -hmm. saying, oh, I can deal with it all. And I may have to say, I'm going to have to take a minute and process this, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so when you were talking about the workplace, the women, they... I, I, I totally agree with you. Sometimes the condition or the environment makes you feel like you have to behave and act a certain way. And so I, I, I say, you know, confident women don't um, react, we attack. And we attack in terms of, attack in terms of being on the um, offensive, not defensive when it comes to reprogramming your thoughts reprogramming your mind and determining how you're going to show up. So if you have situations, especially in the workplace, and you need to be able to communicate assertively, not aggressively, because aggressive is, you know, it's not working for you um, and it's not working for anybody, but assertively being able to say and communicate what you need and want without feeling guilty. I think that women in the workplace just need to be empowered with the tools there are a lot of tools that are available, communications tools and strategies to help them show up in a way where they don't have to feel like they're actually a puppet and someone's pulling the string and they feel like they're, a, you know, they <laughs> they're not the puppet master, but our environment and our conditioning certainly influences how we show up. And we bring that, you know, you're, you're a Caribbean woman, I'm a Caribbean um, African women as well, and our socialization, our culture influences how we show up in the workplace too. So I want to say we cannot ignore that piece, mm -hmm. we cannot just overlook that everyone's coming to the workplace with their own set of ideals and beliefs and conditionings, and that influences how we communicate with other people and also how we communicate with ourselves. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. Absolutely. Absolutely. I know um, what, what you were saying about, you know, us being um, Caribbean, African women, uh, part of what we're taught to be is not necessarily submissive, but polite, right? Um, to, to, not, to not push the envelope too much, but at the same time, we're reared by women who are very strong in their character, right? And so that can be a conflict because I want to be assertive, but I don't want to be seen as aggressive because aggression doesn't get me anywhere, mm. right? And I think um, when people are, or when a, a person is, is kind of 
given that label, um, it stops them from developing professionally, personally, and otherwise, right? And so um, that is something that, it, it's such a fine line. And I think um, this is especially why I think the kind of work that you do is so impactful to so many, not only to women, women of color, but to men as well, um, because men go through these same things and, and each person in the workplace needs an ally right? We need an ally to be able to be empathetic to, to whatever experience that we might be going through um, to help us get to that next level. And I think we need to impart upon each other a little bit of grace um, and compassion, right? Because that'll help us um, deal not only with each other, but with ourselves on a, a little deeper level. I um, agree 100%. And yeah, you know, the whole... <laughs> You, you brought up the Caribbean, the Caribbean um, African heritage, and it's true because there's so many things about our cultures that are great, right? We love the food, we love the music, we love, love the food. Oh my God, <laughs> we love the beach, we love all of these great things that we love. We love the dialect, the, everything that is exciting. There's so much great, rich stuff about our cultures, but there's also that not so good stuff right? Like what you said, you know, being strong and being polite, mm -hmm. but, you know, sometimes the things that are like, we are talking about being loyal <laughs> to a fault, no matter what, or you might find a situation where someone is having a challenge, mental challenge or emotional challenge, you know, and those things are being labeled as negative or you know people say oh they're crazy they're crazy they, brushed they, went, to the, they went to the crazy house i mean oh can, can you imagine the crazy house you know so going through your emotions <laughs> you're going through your emotions so the, the culture there are a lot of things i feel especially for people who have caribbean and african culture heritage that the, the socialization i want you to take the good things from your culture um and you know kind of like put those negative things to the side because it's, it's not, it's not cool to say or feel like you're crazy or you're just insane when you're going through normal emotions. We're taught to just stuff those things in. Nobody needs to know what's going on. If you have a challenge or a situation, just keep your head down and push through or pray about it. Don't ever, ever, ever look for professional help because you don't need that. What, what, what's going on? And so yeah, that's, that's such a huge stigma. <laughs> And I think people need to talk to other people who can guide them in a yep. way that, that, that a professional can. I think this is so necessary. And, and even the stigma of mental illness in, in our particular cultures, it's, it's sad to me that it is a stigma, period. You know, it is in the United States, but I feel like it's multiplied um, when we're talking about, you know, maybe a hundredfold. It's on steroids. It's yeah, on steroids. It, it really <laughs> is. It's, it's just running this, this race that nobody else can catch up to. And, and I think, you know, discussions about emotions, you know, um, they have to be had. And I think too, also in our particular cultures that it, it, because we don't always deal with it in the moment, because we're not given the permission to do it culturally, we're not given the tools to do it. And if we do have the tools, we are ashamed to get access to those tools. That later manifests itself um, in a negative way when we're talking about our health, you know? And, and that is something that I think, that it, that's one of the reasons why I think talking about emotions is so very necessary. Mm -hmm. I think like my parents' generation in particular, um, they were not um, ones to delve deeply into their feelings. Right. And I'm hoping yeah. that that shift is starting to occur now with our generation and the ones thereafter. Well, things like this, for thing, conversations like this that you're having, I mean, these are the things that will help to increase the awareness, you know, so and it's not just the emotions. I mean, thinking about kids, kids who have disabilities, you know, they're not embraced. Exactly. People would, would, would tease them. So we have to shift that conversation. We have to talk about it, you know, and make sure that it is, it is safe and that we, we normalize it. Because yes. when we don't normalize it, that's when people feel afraid or they feel ashamed. And yes. no one is going to win when we talk about having productive and positive relationships. These things spill over into our marriages with our, with our kids. I have two boys. And I'll tell you, just growing up, growing up with those cultures, you're like, kids don't, they're not supposed to talk back. They're not supposed to, you know, they're not supposed to do a whole lot of stuff. And you know, <laughs> you handle the kids. But sometimes that's not the right way. 
right. there, there are things that can be damaging to others. And this spills over, like you said, into our health into their well-being, into their self-esteem, but it shows up in the workplace. So you think that you have a problem with your coworker, you have a problem with your boss, not realizing that you haven't taken the time to unpack those cultural and societal things that have been passed down to you. Mm -hmm. You haven't taken that step to actually learn more about yourself so that you can have fulfilling relationships. You find yourself isolated and lonely and you think, oh, they all, they always out to get me. Oh but my goodness. You don't even realize yeah. that what you need to do it, from, a, from a communication standpoint is go a little bit inside mm -hmm. before you go outside. Yes, absolutely. Before we attack, you know, defensively, as you said, we need to retreat and, and kind of gather ourselves together so we can, we can be on the, on the offensive, I think. You know, we can say, okay, well, this is my strategic plan for handling this. And, and I think once we're able to look within, well, I, I can even say, I, as a mother of a young son as well, um, I, I think we, we start out culturally, we're told, you know, especially with boys, don't cry right? And sometimes I think we need to let them cry because crying is a natural emotional release, right? And I think it's, it's even a bit sexist to say um, that women can have a good cry, yet men are not expected to cry. And I'm thinking, well, what if I want to go kickboxing to get out my emotions? What if I want to do that? <laughs> don't worry, everyone. I'm not going to. <laughs> I don't know how. But kickboxing you know, is fine. I love it. What yes, I, I would like to learn, but that's not going to happen <laughs> anytime soon. But you know, what if I want to exercise and, and work out. So I think a lot of times people think, well, men are going to go, you know, work out and, and get their get their emotions out in a physical way, yet women um, are expected almost to, okay, go cry by yourself someplace, right? And I think we, we do men a disservice. We, we really do men a disservice. And I think um, as a person who is a feminist, I think that you know, that doesn't mean being anti-men. It, it actually means having, raising men and boys with, well, raising boys who become men with um, the, the clear understanding that, that women and men can do the same things and deserve the same rights and respect. And, you know, that could be with regard to, you know, um, pay uh, at the workplace with regard to, you know, equal access to education, but also too, I think we, in the, the argument um, to propel this kind of feminist thinking forward that um, men aren't taught that it's okay for you guys to be emotional. It doesn't mean that you are weak in any way. And, and again, that's why I commend you on the work that you do because getting people in touch with their emotions not only as we discussed, you know, helps them improve their personal relationships, but I dare say it would make them more productive at work, right? Um, we do want people to be able to, you know, be in a meeting and not leave stressed out for the wrong reason, you know? You know, and it's, it's, it's funny you say that. So, and I have had the privilege to coach several men in different areas, different categories, and we're all the same at the end of the day. As human beings, we all move through those emotions. We all have physical you know, desires. We all have emotional desires. And emotional intelligence is not just about emotions. It's not just about negative emotions or positive emotions. It's the whole compilation. So when you are dealing with yourself, yes, we, we tend to focus on, oh, that person needs emotional intelligence because they're coming across the wrong way. But again, it's like, do I know what I'm good at? It's, it's about my, my decision making. Can I prioritize? Do I know when I'm most productive? So it's not just that piece. And then being able to read, people put on social masks. So when you are first encountering them, you will probably not get to the root of an issue or a situation. You have to be able to be aware. And in that moment, see what's being said and what's not being said. For men, I mean, I have two boys. It's my responsibility to go into myself, learn more about myself so that I could bring that awareness and my behaviors and my language. I mean, kids pick up things. Kids pick up things all the time. <laughs> Subconsciously, they pick up things. And, and if we are not aware as parents, we don't know what we're passing on to our kids. Yes. We just happen to see behaviors and we, we're not even sure where those behaviors are coming from, but we have to be aware. We have to take the time to learn, unpack, discover, and then be intentional about the message that we want to communicate. 
little small messages here and there, you know, how we see people, how we judge people, how we speak about others, how, how we laugh at certain jokes when, when things are made. All of these things are giving our kids cues and they're taking their guidance or their lesson from how we respond to certain things. So if we're doing that and then we say, oh, you should not be that way. You need to be kind to your friends at school. Mm -hmm. But you over there on the phone talking bad about your girlfriend um, okay. to the next girlfriend. I mean, come on. Hello. You, <laughs> you have to have some congruency in yeah. what you're doing. And a lot of people miss that piece. But for men, I, I have to raise my boys to be uh, respectable, to be kind, so that, and I pray that they meet up with women whose parents have also taken that time so Absolutely. that when they do meet that right woman in the future, that that person can compliment them, that person can show them respect and have gone through that own, you know, healing process. I want them to be, to be men of, of worth. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we have to make sure that we start by example. I love that you said that, Monique, because I was just telling a friend, because um, everything you're saying today is bringing up different recent conversations that I've <laughs> had. And so um, I was just telling a friend um, when I was dropping my little one off at school, um, I said, all right, let's go. We got to go. And so, you know, we're doing our morning hustle, getting where we need to go. And I saw another mom who was also bringing her little one to school. And he, well, she said, you know, essentially the same thing. Come on, let's go. We got to go. And the little boy um, responded to her in a way that was shocking to me. Um, and, and I dare say, um, I don't think I'm a person that's easily shocked. I'm not clutching my pearls, um, <laughs> little thing. But, but he responded to her by using an expletive. This child was not older than seven years old, still in a car seat. And what was interesting to me, once I recovered from hearing that, was that the mother seemed to take this as normal conversation. And she, you know, she was like, well, you know, I'm tired of you, you know, doing this, let's go. And he said it again and again. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, I would not have lived that long <laughs> um, if I ever had the, <laughs> the even idea to speak to not only my mother, my grandmother, any other person in my life this way, particularly as a child. And when I relay this story to my friend, she also is a mother of two boys. And she said, you know, more is caught than taught. Mm -hmm. And so that reminds me of what you're saying. Um, and, and I thought to myself, wow, we, we, that child learned that behavior at home and that the mother was not shocked that this came out of the child's mouth because kids say things because they keep them up from everything, you know, in every place. But, but that this was not something that seemed like a big deal really shook me to my core for a moment. And I thought that mother's emotional reaction too was going to dictate their relationship for a very long time and and you see problems that could have been prevented that may arise that you hope don't you know it goes back to the old adage when parents say do what i say not what i do but mm -hmm. we have to do what you do right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that was a perfect example so you saw that experience through the lens you said you heard what you said you know you would never be able to do it if with your mom your parents your grandma so and, and neither would i but you're seeing that we are seeing that um, interaction through the, through the lens of how we were raised. Absolutely. Now, Absolutely. Is, is, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? According to how we were raised, it would be in that bad box, but everyone isn't raised the same way. Exactly. So that, how we see people interacting with their children, we have to be very careful because we ha how we see people interacting with their children, it doesn't mean that our standard is the standard. Exactly. Our standard in our own home is the standard. Yes, it, it will influence how we interact with other people. But at the end of the day, when we are talking about that whole child, we don't really know what's going on in their home 100%. We don't really, we don't really know. There are some families where that's totally okay. And their people are able to interact with others in a way that's respectful and whatever have you. But we have to be careful not to put our judgment and our our beliefs onto that's it that's it that's it look i i'm telling you i have learned this first hand okay 
firsthand because when I was, when I went through coaching and I went through therapy, I was like, wow, I don't know if I looked at that things that way. Sometimes we just do things because that's the way we have been taught. That's the way right. we've been raised. Um, and yes, there are values and principles that we hold on to, and that's important for us. We have to be careful not to project that on others or, or have those things hinder us from how we are able to connect with another person. Yes. So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing, but I would always say, you know, a lot of times, many people are able to see what's wrong with someone else's, but it's when we pull it in, when we really put that mirror up and be like, okay, yeah, <laughs> what, yeah. what, what, what would someone say about what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, how would that influence my relationship with my children and with my spouse and with my peers? And I think at the end of the day with everything, we have to really focus on making sure that we are building the self-esteem of ourselves and our children. At, at the end of the day, we don't really want to spend and pass down broken children, you know, cycles of broken relationships and strained relationships because we're not speaking up, we're not saying what we need to say. The kids are picking up the silent treatment is in, is in the house. You're not talking to me, I'm not talking to you. They're yeah, picking those, those things up. And then it shows up at work, yeah. right? It shows up at work or, the, or this type of passive aggressive stuff. So it's, I know it's something that we could only really scratch the surface <laughs> today, but over time, over time, it gets better and we're able to see things and relax our judgment and look at someone from a different perspective and say, okay, at the core, this person is whole, this person is good. And let me relax my judgment of this person. Let me not pay attention to what they're wearing or how they're presenting themselves or how they're speaking before I try to connect with them and engage with them. And that's, that's really, I think, fundamental for interpersonal relationships. Monique, I feel like you were following me around yesterday. I was like, you know what? You have a GPS on me somewhere. But <laughs> because after that experience, because I, I try to be intentional and I try very hard to to, to recognize, because when you said we're looking at our own cultural lens, I tried very hard to do that. And so, because I was judging, I totally was judging. We and, all do. Yeah, yeah. And I was good with it because I was like, all right, I'm human. I'm going to judge. I'm judging. What happened to me in the few moments after, and it happens quickly, I think, again, because we practice riding that bicycle, right? Before I even opened the school doors, I, I said to myself, you know what? I have to feel compassion for that woman because I don't know what she's going through today. I don't know why her child is saying that, you know, but I, I know that that can't be easy to hear as a parent, right? As, and then it can't be easy when you have other parents around you who've also heard that, right? And I said to myself, you know what, she might be having a hard day um, because we're all running to get the kids in school. And, and so in that moment, I thought, you know, by extending her this grace, even though she, you know, she's not paying attention to me. She has no idea. She's trying to get her kid to school. But I thought it was really important for me to extend her that grace for my own sake. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that in that same moment, I went through this complete cycle of, you know, watching this kid speak to his mom in a way that I, I for sure felt um, was disrespectful. But then my my and knowing that I recognized it, you know, for me, it's something that's disrespect, disrespectful. But in that next moment, I looked at her. So I kind of shifted what the child was saying to what she might be feeling, mm. right? And I just thought to myself, wow. Like, and it was an epiphanous moment because I just thought, oh, wow. I, I shifted from one feeling of shock and somewhat horror <laughs> to another of, I hope she's going to be okay today. You know, and it was, it was kind of strange. And then, you know, we're like, all right, let's get to school because you don't have a moment to really focus on that. But you're bringing that back to mind, that entire scenario. And Monique, why are you following me around on Monday mornings school? Or wait, what's today? <laughs> <laughs> see, see how that happens? But it, it was one of those things. And I, I dare say, you know, at the workplace, how many times do we do that? How often do we jump to that conclusion? You know, and because of work pressures and everything we have to do, we, we don't even allow ourselves to take that internal pause so we can have that internal grace towards someone else for our own sake, 
right? And I, I dare say, like, if I saw her again, you know, I look at her differently than I did in that first moment, right? Um, because I didn't see her exiting the school, but I, I, at first I was just like, what kind of parenting lets this happen? You know, the next moment thereafter, I was like, wow, my heart went out to her, you know, but, but that, wow, you just took me on another journey. <laughs> oh my God, like that was awesome. And you're so right. You're so right. And I think that what, even just the energy, I, I am a strong believer in the energy that we surround ourselves with. Even it doesn't have to be someone that we know, but just that, that, that energy that we are sending towards someone when we are judging them, yeah. you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's not good for them. It's not good for us. Exactly. It's not can good. You imagine. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It, yeah. it, culturally, culturally, something like that were to happen. Well, I wouldn't say now because these days you just can't tell. Things have changed so drastically over the years. Indeed. But in, in, back in the day, something like that happens. You you would not only have the judgment of one, you would have the judgment of everybody. Every single person. You letting him talk to you like that? Exactly. You, letting, you know. <laughs> would happen if we all took that energy and shifted it into something positive towards oh. somebody, right? Think about the wellness, the, the emotional and physical wellness that would create for someone, the self-esteem that would build in the person that's the recipient of that energy, right? Even if they don't know us, even if we don't interact with them, you know, consistently, but I feel like what we, what we create and put out there will find them, right? By sheer virtue of our will, Right. And just I feel like we emanate um, with energy, be it positive or negative. We emanate um, that energy. It's a it's a it's a tangible force. Yeah. And so, you know, I think when we are in that positive headspace that we need to do for ourselves, as you said, internally, um, that's the only way we're going to be able to extend that to anybody, you mm -hmm. know, and do show that grace. But having said that, then, because we're going to wrap up now, this has been so fun for me. I've been looking for it. Tell me about it. I was like, this is going to be great. <laughs> but what are two pieces of advice that you'd like to impart upon our listeners? The advice I'd say for anybody listening or watching is start inside. Learn about your communication style. In the U.S., there's about $359 billion that are, is spent every year on conflict on conflict and and two main drivers are that of that are personality clashes and unclear expectations so let's throw out the unclear expectations personality clashes those things can be addressed by starting to learn more learn more about your communication style learn more about your energy style um, take an emotional intelligence course it will definitely help you begin to move the needle and then the next thing is just be gentle with yourself, man. You know, just don't beat yourself up. You're great. You're doing a good job. If you fall off one day, start over. Start over and don't hold yourself in the negative thought. I love a, it. Thought, a thought process. I love it. Thank you, Monique. And now tell our listeners where they can find you. Yeah, you can find me everywhere on the internet. Right. <laughs> At Claire Communication Coach. My website is ClaireCommunicationSolutions.com. You can go to LinkedIn and hit me up at Claire Communication Coach, Facebook, Instagram, Claire Communication Coach. And I would be looking forward to your LinkedIn connection requests. So Thank tell me how you, how you loved our conversation and let's start a dialogue. Absolutely, absolutely. Our, our go-to phrases here, um, let's keep the conversation going um, because I hope that this um, episode that we're having today, this wonderful interview, um, really just starts water cooler conversations, you know, gets people thinking on their drive home when they're listening to this, um, gets couples talking at home, you know, more about their day and how they're feeling um, towards each other, gets parents talking to kids. So I'm really hoping, you know, this affects people not only on a peer-to-peer, -peer, in a peer-to-peer -peer relationship, but um, in, in their personal relationships. Um, so they can, they can delve deeper within and, and really put that beautiful energy out there. So Monique Russell of Clear Communication Solutions, thank you so much for joining us today on the Global Fluency Podcast. And for everybody listening out there, thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode and let's keep the conversation going. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. 
Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences, leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going, going, going.